No look at 2.4 gig radio control technology would be complete without an inspection of the one that started it all, the DSM or DSM-2 now, system from Spectrum, which has also been used in the JR 2.4 gig radio systems like this, uh, DSX-9, which is uh, about to be superseded by the, was it 9503 or something in the US? But anyway, this has been the, the backbone of the JR 2.4 gig series for some time. It uses DSM-2, which is a tried and proven 2.4 gigahertz uh, radio system. And this particular radio comes with an RD921 receiver and its little satellite, just like the, the FlySky um, $13 radio. But we'll look closely at the system. I won't focus on the radio itself because, as I say, these are about to be superseded by a couple of new models from JR. But I will look at the DSM technology, the, uh, the technology that really kicked off 2.4 gigahertz for model control. Uh, one comment, though, I don't know why they provide a four cell nickel metal battery, and it's only an AA pack, with a radio that is known to have problems with low voltage brownouts. Um, why? Surely it's time JR moved into the 21st century and started providing lithium based batteries for both the transmitter and receiver. A123s are perfect for the 2.4 gig radio receivers we have around today. They're just over six volts. They'll deliver large amounts of current without blinking. You won't get those brownouts. So what is the point of a 1500 milliampere hour four cell nickel metal battery? Anyway, and the transmitter, again, it has nickel metal battery in it. What's wrong with lithium? In fact, if you're thinking, well, I'll just throw in a three cell lithium from Hobby King or something, don't. Because in the instructions for this radio, it quite clearly states you should not use a three cell lithium because it will cause the regulator trans transistor in this uh, radio to overheat and may cause failure. So do it at your own peril. But if you're going to make declarations like that, JR, then please, please come up with a radio that uses a lithium battery in it. Because these have got a 9.6 volt nickel metal pack. You don't need that. Everything in here, everything in here runs on no more than 5 volts. So you're wasting almost half the power of that battery. It's going up as heat. What a waste. Anyway, back to the radio and how it performs. Now, I've got the spectrum analyzer here. I'll switch it into its two-dimensional mode and we'll take a look at how this radio uses the 2.4 gig band. Okay, now here is the ambient spectrum inside my uh, iron hanger or workshop where there's very, very little noise on the 2.4 gigahertz band. All this is just basically background hiss at 2.4 gigahertz. Now, I take the transmitter and I turn it on. Instantly, you'll notice that there's a big peak here and further over, another big peak forms. These are the two operating channels that the Spectrum system is using to communicate between transmitter and receiver. Now you'll notice also, quite uh, interestingly, this is quite a, a, a shallow peak. The, the, it sp spreads out quite nicely towards the bottom, which means that the signal is being spread quite widely. And that, that's very good, because the wider we get our signal spread, then the wider the interference has to be, or the more interference has to be, to actually override that signal and cause problems. So, as we said here, this is a pretty good system. That's why Spectrum has survived for so long and, and hasn't really been changed that much because most of the time it actually just works. And it works pretty well. At the moment, um, I have a good lock between transmitter and receiver. When I move the sticks, the servos move. What more could you ask for, really? Um, now, I would have said that this is good. But one of the problems I've found with the Spectrum system is that sometimes these channels are not far enough apart to be useful. Now, they seem to be allocated more or less at random. Um, so here we have them, sort of one's centered on about 2.43 gigahertz, the other one's centered on about 2.47 gigahertz. So they're, they're quite a way apart. What I'm going to do is turn the transmitter off and on again and see if we get peaks and here we go. So now we have one channel down here and another channel there. Now these other, the first two channels are still there because this averages over time, but our two channels have now appeared in a different place. We change nothing, it's still totally quiet. So when the system, when the, when the background noise is low, it seems to just randomly allocate its channels. And 99.9% .9 of the time it does that quite well with a good spacing between them. I'll try again, see what we get. Okay. This time, seems to have not changed its channels. It's using the same ones it was before. Try another. 
set up, I'll turn everything off, turn it on again, there we go, so now it's using some different, different channels, it's using here and here now, so we can see that it's, it's moving about all the time, and, and, and as I say, most of the time, the allocation of channels is pretty damn good. It puts the channels fairly well spaced and at relatively different parts of the band, which is good. But on some occasions, that's not quite the case. On some occasions, I've found very rarely both channels are almost on top of each other, which is not a good situation. In fact, there's an article now on the icmodelreviews.com website which will explain and demonstrate what I mean because it does have an impact on the system's ability to resist interference. And that's quite important. Uh, well, generally speaking, the DSM system is going to give you a pretty good resilience to interference, but on the one in a thousand occasion, when it appears to operate almost as a single frequency system, you're far more vulnerable to uh, interference on the band. So please go and read that article. Uh, there'll be a link to it beside this video if you're looking at it on the YouTube page. Now here's a good example of how this dual channel redundancy offered by DSM actually works. At the moment, the system's using two frequencies, and Coincidentally, one of these frequencies happens to be on exactly the same frequency as a video transmitter I have nearby. At the moment, when the system is turned on, I get um, very reliable movement of the servo when I move the transmitter. As you can see, the servo's moving fine. All right, now what I'm going to do is turn on the video transmitter. So it's quite a powerful video transmitter, 600 milliwatts. There we go. You'll notice instantly that the video signal is clobbering that channel. Give it a few minutes to, to show you the density that's being created. I'll go to the 3D view here. And you can see there is the channel. There's the video transmitter coming on. It's clobbered. It's right over the top of it. This channel is still free and clear. So we would expect that our control of the Survey will remain unchanged. So I'll have a look and see. Indeed, it's all working as if there was no interference at all. So even though we've effectively lost one channel of our of our two-channel system, one, one of the frequencies is lost to interference because this video transmitter is producing a, a very strong signal that is every bit as strong as the transmitter. The servo is still working, so that's why. Two frequencies are better than one. It's also why three frequencies are better than two. And in some cases, it's also why all the frequencies are best of all. So now um, I'll remove the video transmitter from this equation. And we'll see that the signal from the JR transmitter or the spectrum system is still there, hiding under all that noise. Everything still works. So that's why DSM-2 uses two frequencies. And that's why most 2.4 gig systems these days use at least two frequencies. In fact, uh, SAN uses two frequencies, DSM uses two frequencies, most of the others use three or more, um, except perhaps the FlySky, which just uses one. But then again, that, we're talking about a $13 receiver and a $15 transmitter module, so not quite in the same league as the DSM or JR equipment. 